the history is what makes fan carving what it is. It goes back to the early 1600s that we can actually document and, and trace it back to that time. I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to start with the legend of the fan bird. Many years ago in medieval Russia, when people lived in one room houses and had one small window and one small smoky fireplace and the whole family lived in one room, there was a boy that was laying ill in his bed. And people from neighboring villages came to help him get better and nothing worked. And the little boy was tired of the smoke, he was tired of, of being sick, he was tired of winter because when winter is there, it's six months of darkness. And so his father was sitting by the, the fireplace mending baskets and making cream ware, much like they do in today's world. And the little boy raised up and he said, Daddy, is summer coming soon? And his father said, Yes, son, very soon. Just hang on a little bit longer and summer will be here. And then he thought, I'll make him a bird. When the sun returns, the birds return, and everybody is happy. And so he made him a bird with two wings and a tail. And he hung the bird up over the fireplace so the lad could see it from his bed. Well, the hot air streams of the fireplace caused the bird to start to spin, started flapping its wings. It assumed the powers of the Holy Spirit. The little boy got better. People from neighboring villages returned and said, what did you do to regain his health? And when they heard the story of the bird, they said, would you make one for our family to guard and protect our home? So in David's and my research, we can't say absolutely, but it's, it uh, looks as if what we could say today is that the origin of the fan bird could be right in this region called Karelia, Russia. It's Russian today, but at one time it was Finland. At one time it was Sweden. These countries were so fought over that they, um, they it's, it's difficult to put a timeline to the time. You, if you knew the time period exactly, then you could put what country it was to the timeline. But anyway, um, it appears that the, the trade ships would, would sail into this bay here, the North Sea, and the people that would make these birds or any of these old world folk arts, they would come down to the wharfs and they would sell their goods to the trade ships. Then the trade ships would sail out of here and come around the North Cap and go into the fjords and into the, the docks and they'd sell their wares to the tradesmen that would come down and pick them up. And then those trade routes would follow in through Europe and, and you know, follow the regular trade routes. We were confused about that until we met with Santa Claus up here in Roveniemi at the Arctic Circle. And he said, I am very familiar with the fan bird. He said, uh, and he's the one that pointed it out. He says, any of these old world folk arts, if you can take them back far enough, would probably come out of this area. And so that, because we thought it came from Sweden this way, which it may have, we, we don't know. Um, but that, that's one reason it could have. But we know in, in Sweden, they have the postage stamps, the pulpit bird, which hung in, over the minister's head in the pulpits, uh, is on their stamp of 1981, and uh, they call it the pulpit bird. And then the pelican bird, which stands by the christening fount, and that's more of an Easter symbol, that's usually, um, and that's on their red stamp there. So these are the Swedish postage stamps. Finland has their pelican bird. The story of the pelican goes back to the second century of Alexandria, Egypt, where the pelican was pecking its breast bloody and the babies drank the blood and they were revived and then the parents died. So this book is, a, is postcards of, oh, this is Slovenia. I might point that out because this is the bird here. We met with the people that made this bird and that's on the Slovenian postage stamp. So these countries have documented some of their heritage. This is Finland again with their fan bird and the St. Thomas cross. But the other pictures in here, and we've got literally hundreds of postcards with the fan bird hanging in the pulpit. 
Now I can't say that they're all fan birds because in Europe today, the bird is still in the pulpit. And most of them are carved out of solid wood and they're gold gilded or they're painted white, but they still have the bird in the pulpit. You can see him hanging there um, down. So the, um, the history really wasn't written about much, but there's a, it's a good valid history that, that started in, in probably in this region and it came through where the, the soldiers took it through. There were so many warring times and people fighting one another that quite often the prisoners of war in some of these camps would teach the townspeople. They seemed to have a certain amount of freedom. And they called it the bird of inspiration. And some people call it the peace bird because they're looking for peace. But this whole range, we were fortunate enough to get four letters that were from ethnographers. Um, Hammerstadt was here in Sweden, and Andre and his wife were here in Germany. They were actually born down here in Austria, but they became uh, curators and then ethnographers, and they worked out of Germany. And this was between 1900 and 1904 that these letters were written. These two went back and forth, and they were talking about the fan bird, and they said that, the, that it was a cultural phenomenon because these birds were found in all the judges' chambers, the courtrooms, any federal building, whether it was a local level or a, a county level or a state level. And they were found in the peasant homes, whether they were in the mountain huts or down to the fertile farmlands. They were found in the elite town fathers' huts, um, and of course in all the churches. From Greece to Lapland, this whole range was full of these fan birds. And today there's almost none. There's one fan carver in Sweden, Tord, does them in Sweden. There's three that we know of in Poland. We just found another one, so there's four, and they're right down here at this area where Ukraine and Slovakia comes together. There's one fan carver in Slovakia. There's five or six right here in Morovia, um, Bohemia, Czech Republic. When we visited there, it was really interesting because it's the Wallachian people that make the fan birds in Bohemia, Czech Republic. And yet, it's the Vlaki, there's two fan carvers here in um, Transylvania, yes, yes, <laughs> and, thank you. And it's the Wallachian people here that make this fan bird too. So I don't know if there was a migration through there. It's interesting because like Sweden owned Germany about down to here. What we know is Germany, the line actually, the Swedish line was down to about this point at one time and yet we see more pelican birds in Germany than we do the doves. Um, we see them in the museums and stuff. They're not necessarily fan birds. We see the fan bird dove there, but we see the pelican pecking his breast in, um, oh, the silversmiths do it, um, the pewter people do it. Um, you see it in ceramic displays. And one man here over in Cottbus, he had seen us at a show <coughs> in Indianapolis, or Souter Village, and he said, uh, he saw us two years in a row and he came back the next year and he says, I saw you last year and he says, I thought, I know those birds, I know those birds. But he says, it took me six weeks to remember. He says, I remember as a child, the writers would come through town and they still do that over in Cottbus here. Um, they, the writers will come through town on Easter Sunday and everybody follows them. You know, they go from village to village. And the people would hang up their fan birds in the windows. And then they'd follow the writers. And he said, uh, and we went to Cottbus looking for fan carvers. And we know of one man during, uh, who was in military there several years ago. And he did buy some birds in Cottbus, but Cottbus didn't know of anybody that did them today, nor did they have them in their museums. Um, over here in, uh, by Stuttgart, if you, by, and by the way, if you people are on Facebook, if you go into Facebook and you look at Fan Carver's World's page on Facebook, um, we have these files of um, these albums of some of these things like Heap and Seppenhof, which is over here. They had um, a fan bird in the chapel. Uh, it was, during those early days, there would be like a little village. There'd be one primary man in charge. He would be the head farmer and then all of these little houses would be like the washer woman in one house, the mill in another house, the lumber man in another house, another house they made charcoal. And so this whole little village is set up over this um, area. And this, that's in Heap and Seppenhof. Um, 
they have a chapel and there's a fan bird in the chapel. There's also a fan bird in the, in the home. And where the fan bird hangs in the home is in the God center of the house. And they still have the God centers today. It's a corner of a room and it's got the um, religious icons are there. Sometimes it's a cabinet. They open the cabinet drawer and you see the three-dimensional icons, but it's usually pictures all lined up in a row on both sides and it's the religious <coughs> whoever they're uh, representing. And so um, that's where the fan bird would be. There was also the fan bird hanging, or not hanging, but painted on the canopy bed, on the ceiling of the canopy bed. And they didn't even know, some of the curators didn't even know that that fan bird was there. But it was blessing the holy matrimony of marriage. Um, the one, one of the ladies there that was um, uh, born and raised in Stuttgart said that she was born and raised in a house that had a fan bird in the kitchen. And when the fan bird was not moving, it meant that there was a death in the family because nobody cooked for three days when somebody died. The neighbors would bring food to that house, but they didn't cook themselves. And so uh, she had a, and otherwise it's fairly well extinct. Slovenia here, they have, um, their take on it is that they have a string system. The bird hangs in the center of the room. It runs through a ring, uh, the string goes up, runs through some rings and down to the door handle. When the door handle is turned and the door is opened, then the bird bobs up and down. And it uh, gives a message to the um, people, alerts the people in the house that somebody has entered. It acts as a doorbell. It also gives a blessing to the person who's, who has entered the house. Um, so those are just some of the things that you find. We also found over here, um, that, um, where Oberammergau, uh, just west of Oberammergau, we found that same legend, or that same custom, I should say, of the fan bird hanging from the ceiling like that and attached to a doorknob. Um, here in Bohemia, they hang it over a baby's crib so that the baby can entertain himself and probably give the mother some time to get her work done. And they claim that it also gives the baby strong eyes and a strong back. And um, he focuses his eyes on that. And so um, <laughs> the uh, Czech people have such good vision, they hardly ever need to have eyeglasses. And surprisingly enough, you hardly ever see anybody with glasses on. <laughs> so um, this is a fan bird I wanted to point out. I think I've covered most of the, the history that we know of. We're, still work we're just now working with uh, Hungary now and uh, that whole region down here. This is a fan bird from Finland, and the same thing has to happen here. We had to have a place to interlock, which is right here and right here. This style, this design, is the same as this design. So he just clipped them off, and he made, this one is broken off. I'm going to have to save that. <coughs> Put it right there. Um, so what has happened is, You've got an interlock here for the shorter one and the same interlock for the longer one, but he's got the longer tail feathers. Um, Slovenia, this is all done by hand here. With, this is three pieces of wood. The, the, the bird and the tail is one piece of wood. These are two se separate pieces glued in. This is all done by a gouge. He didn't use any knives at all on this. This was done with a knife. This one is done with a gouge. And basically the way that they do these, especially this one, is the bird body and the tail is one piece of wood. The wings are seated down into that. The same with this one, and you might be able to see this a little more clear. You can see how the wings are seated down into the bird body. This is a Russian bird. The tail and the bird is one piece of wood. And the wings are one piece of wood seated down into that. There's a fan factory in Archangel, Russia, which is right here, up here on the North Sea. And they still do this. They still make the fan birds today. This bird was given to us. Some people bought a box at a garage sale. 
and this bird was in it. We think it's probably a Czech Republic bird, probably Czechoslovakia, because this is an old bird, and uh, uh, Czechoslovakia would have been there probably when this bird was made. And the reason I say that is because it's got the pointy fingers and stuff, much like they do it today. But I wanted to show you the bottom of the bird is painted. And the only time that we ever saw a bird painted was at the bottom part of the bird. Because see, the bird hangs up like this. And you're only looking at the bottom. So they don't paint the top. And we, in one of our books, it shows in the Austrian uh, Innsbruck Folk Kunst Museum, we had a bird like that. And we took a picture of the bottom of it and the top of it. It's in our book. German prisoner of war did these kinds of things. We got this in a, um, oh, an antique mall. But the German prisoners of war were big at doing this kind of thing, World War I. And um, if you look at our website, fancarversworld.com, we have a link to S.D. Jones. And uh, she collects memorabilia. She doesn't have a lot of fans and bottles, but she's got a lot of information and photos about it. And she doesn't actually have, she has some in her collection, obviously. But some of those that you see, she's just done the research on it. And it's fantastic. You can see five and six big fans with ribbons through it. And quite often, they are decorated with a ribbon through it. More often, ribbons than paint. Oh, the lumberjacks, yeah. The lumberjacks brought it to America in the settling of America. And it was pretty much the Scandinavian lumberjacks that brought it, and they did these in the lumber camps. And so you hear some of that history here in Michigan, especially up north in some of the museums and stuff, you know, about the fan carvers and stuff. Okay, well, t this evening we'd like to demonstrate how we make a, a fan bird. From this, uh, we make this one piece of wood from this piece of wood right here. Nothing is glued on. We, we don't use any glue. And I, I'm going to start with demonstrating how we get the wood out of the tree and what types of wood that work. This is white cedar. We use white cedar. We uh, buy logs of white cedar and we obtain these north of here, north of Grand Rapids. Uh, the farther north, the wider the di di uh, diameter. We try to have uh, wood that's 10 to 12 inches in diameter. And we take the wood from the outside and uh, what I try to do is have half sapwood and half heartwood so you get a two-tone bird. And uh, the reason for the diameter being 10, 12 inches is because you're going to take two inches of straight wood from a round tree. And I'll demonstrate how we do that. This is all low tech. What we do first is just score Score the wood, move it over about two inches. That's all you need to do. And then I use a screwdriver, or you could use a chisel. I, use, I like to use a screwdriver and just go across it about three quarters of an inch in or from the outside. The, uh, the first blank is the most difficult to get out, but uh, once you get that out, it's uh, quite easy. Then you just uh, tap it, and it comes right out. From this blank, uh, it's, it, it may have enough moisture in the springtime to make birds. Uh, you need moisture to turn the feathers so they don't break. And uh, what I do once I get the, the wood out, I shape it up a little bit. That's not bad. Then I just use a chisel and maybe smooth it out. Uh, you have to remember that on the outside is still the bark. And all you do is cut that off. Once you get one blank out, the rest is quite easy. All you do score it, put your knife blade in from the hatchet, and just go around 
the round. And then shape them up. And then I take these, I put them in a, a pot of water with some stones on top to submerge them and a lid. And I put it on the stove and let it, uh, when it starts to boil, the water starts to boil. Then I put it on low heat and let it simmer for about two hours. After two hours, um, after when it cools, I dump the water out. I may put uh, clean water in and let it soak another day or so. Um, it's usually, when it's done, I don't feel like doing that, so I put more water in, just let it set and do it when it's convenient. Then the water moisture, it's quite heavy in the blank. And then uh, I categorize these blanks. The very best blank um, were the fibers. And this is probably the key to the white cedar wood or any other wood that you might use for fan carving. You see the fibers here on the outside of the round. It has to be straight. So when we purchase a tree or a log, we look at the bark. If the bark is straight, the fibers are straight. A lot of white cedar has a twist to it. You don't want that. Straight fiber. Because when you're riving the feathers, you're splitting rather than cutting. It's just like I got these blanks out, and you see how straight they are. If it had a curve to it, the hatchet would follow the curve. If you're riving feathers, the same thing. You're going with the fiber. That's what you need. We use white cedar. In Europe, they use fir, spruce, willow, and in Scandinavia, aspen. But any wood that has long straight fiber that's like for used for making baskets would work for fan carving. So think of that. And then the woods I mentioned, fir, spruce, white cedar, it's from the pine family. So think of that. And I, I, we use the outside. You can go one more time around and then that would be solid heartwood. So it's a brown color. The, I'm going to pass this blank around. This has been uh, in the water. We boiled. And then when we're, we're done with it, I put them in, I meant in three categories. The very, very best we sell. It doesn't matter which end you put the feathers on. The straightest is where you put them on. Then we have teaching blanks where maybe there's a little curve at one end or a little knot hole. Then we put the feathers on the best end the bird body up here and cut off that little imperfection. The third category is what we use for our birds because Sally is so good at riving she can make a bird almost out of anything. But uh, are there any questions on the wood? <laughs> Freeze it. Oh. After I put these in categories then I put it in in freezer bags and then we freeze it. So when people order wood I ship it frozen. It has adequate moisture in there. We like to do the entire bird uh, with moisture in it. When I pass these around, a dry piece and a wet piece, you can feel the difference. And the riving. You want me to turn it? Yeah. No. The, the riving, uh, we like the wet the wood. The it's, it's possible some people do the bird dry. And then before they turn the feathers, then they put it in boiling water at the hinge where the feather can turn. So there's different ways of doing it. If you have an opportunity to learn this from different people, from every fan carver, you gain more information. And uh, it's, it's just fun to do. Is it possible to get a water too wet? Yes. Um, Sally? Well. Some people like, some fan carvers keep uh, a five gallon bucket of water and little pieces of wood in there and they work right from that. You might see that in various places. I don't like to work my wood that wet because it's kind of mushy. Mm -hmm. So I like, there's a moisture content that's nice. So this, this needs to be saturated but not slimy saturated. When we first started, we, we, we've done, we've been there and done that. 
We've had buckets and we've had blanks in the water. Just soaking it does not necessarily penetrate the water through the center. And what happens is the fibers on the outside begin mushy and uh, smelly. It's slimy, stinks. Uh, even though white cedar um, can be done from a fresh tree that's just cut in the springtime, it has enough moisture in to, to do the bird. You smell that and it has a, it's from a swamp. White cedar is in a swamp, it has this swamp smell. It smells just like fresh cow manure. <laughs> you know? So it's up to you. In Europe, they'll take a block of wood in a glass, hot water, uh, electric pot, and they just let it boil away until it sinks to the bottom of the pot. And then they say, now, we're, now we carve. Now we're, now we're ready. So it's like that much moisture content. But we are always working with big vats of wood, so we put weights on them. <laughs> I, boil, I boil all the wood regardless of the moisture content when we get the tree. The sooner you get the tree, the better. You, um, I, I'm going to get some logs shortly, and uh, they can lay until <coughs> spring with, because of the cold weather. Once I cut the, I take a chainsaw and I do five or six inch rounds. We have a few items for six inches. Then I lay them on the ground and I keep a garden hose on them, if this is in the summertime, to keep them wet. When I split the wood, this split very nice. This has been uh, outside, but it's still dry. But uh, if it's moist, it uh, rives, you get the blanks out a lot easier. And then when I, then I, when I get these out, then I put them in a bucket, and then I smooth them out before I put them in the freezer. But uh, Depending on the time of the year as well, because in the course in the spring, the sap is up, and uh, you have more moisture content. This time of the year, it's down. But it's this time of the year that the loggers are in the woods. <laughs>